Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and coming up on One Detroit, it's all about arts and culture. This month marks the 10th anniversary of Detroit Month of Design, how inclusive design in communities is more important than ever. Plus, Darkroom Detroit on the power of visual storytelling, Sphinx founder Aaron Dworkin on the role of women in jazz, and a symphony of the people with the DSO. It is all right now on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to Bear Paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. And viewers like you. Hey, One Detroit, welcome to the show. I'm Christy McDonald. I hope you're having a great week so far. We are focusing on arts and culture in Southeast Michigan and how COVID is changing the way we're experiencing it. We have some great stories for you. From a Detroit group that focuses on visual storytelling and photography to Sphinx founder Aaron Dworkin and his Arts Engine interview with Terry Lynn Carrington on the role of women in jazz to a spectacular performance curated by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra featuring music lovers like you. It's a symphony of the people. You'll see it coming up. But we're starting off with the Detroit Month of Design. And in light of the global pandemic and protests against police brutality around the country, inclusive design for communities is more important than ever. Will Glover talked with Olga Stella from Design Corps Detroit and Kiana Wenzel, Director of Culture and Community. We are celebrating 10 years of a month of design. So how did this month of design get started and what can we look forward to? Yes, so the month of design was started in 2011 by Matthew Clayson and Melinda Anderson. Uh, Matt was the original executive director of Design Corps and Melinda was leading the programming at that time. So the first festival was one week. It was called the Detroit Design Festival. And it had about 80 happenings happening all over the city. It was a celebration of independent design. Since then, it's evolved into a whole month. It still is a multidisciplinary festival, an annual, annual festival occurring throughout the city. This year, we have virtual, outdoor, and time ticketed indoor events. Now, that is one of the first things that I was curious about. A lot of art and design is something that, you know, people have to interact with on a daily basis. So how have you guys been working around the current pandemic and all the guidelines that we need to follow to actually be able to have people go out and see this stuff in person? It started with contacting the designers after the open call. So we started 2020, big dreams, big plans. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We launched our open call in February and it closed in April. So once the government shut down, which was in March, we said, well, is this festival important to designers? Do they see a value in it? Do they still want to do it? So I immediately started calling, you know, the designers that had applied and talking to them. And a lot of them said, you know what, I have an idea. I have a solution that I want to share. I have a talk that I want to propose of how we can address this new reality. We need the festival now more than ever. And, you know, I can do my talk virtual. Oh, I'm, I'm going to do an outdoor installation. So it's through talking to the designers that we said, our community still wants to do this and they see a value in it and we're going to continue. Yeah. 
And by using time ticketed events and kind of no touch or very low touch outdoor things, you know, a lot of the concerns around having large groups and small spaces are signature events like Easter Market After Dark and design crawls and some of the other things that we're doing. We're not doing those this year precisely because of the pandemic. But I think what's been wonderful is to see how our community has really pivoted, that we have a, the strongest slew of exhibitions that we've ever had uh, for a month of design. And many of those are, are fully accessible virtually um, from our website. So it's just, it's just really been great to see how everyone has adapted um, and, the, and the really meaningful ideas that they're putting forward even in this time. So we hear the word design and I'm sure as with a lot of people and same goes for me, you can think of a million different things. So what type of things are we going to be seeing when it comes to design? Is it painting? Is it sculpture? Is it, you know, city planning? What, what can we look forward to? Sure. It's a lot of events that are dealing with and addressing, of course, the global pandemic. Um, so we have our new social reality, um, the future of urgency. Olga's going to be on a panel. Um, Noor from Form and Seek, she has an exhibition called Never Normal. Were things ever normal? You know, and what does it mean? What does normal mean in exploring that? Um, we have some LTU and CCS students that made work during the pandemic. What is it, how does that change the way that you work in your process of designing when you can't go to the studio because the studio shut down and you're making products from your house? Yeah, and design for us is everything, you know, we consider it creative problem solving. So it's all the disciplines. It's applied um, in many ways, but that can mean visual art in public spaces too, because there's usually a context, and especially for the types of things that you'll see in the uh, month of design program. That um, you know, there's a lot. Usually, the the, the designers that we're featuring, you know, we have three values that we operate uh, with: collaborative relationships, accessible experiences, um, accessible opportunities, and diverse experiences. And a lot of the um, the public um, kind of art type type of things that you'll see in the month of design um, usually involve community, you know, community engagement, community participation. Um, so it's the full full gamut from architecture to product design to, to graphic and visual design um, to um, art and public spaces. Is there an installation, a talk, a uh, an art piece that? really speaks to you that you think would and is going to be really impactful when you know people actually get a chance to interact with it. Olga, let's start with you. Well, I have, I have two, um, so I'm going to use my executive privilege to have two, but uh, one is the Science Gallery um, Future uh, Present Exhibition, because I was, able, I was one of the five curators for that, um, that exhibition, and I think it's, it's uh, immersive and experiential. Um, it's not a typical exhibition where you just have, you're looking at an object. This is really about engaging um, the, 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 the person as they, as they think about um, design in a time of urgency. And then the second one is uh, the Toyota Lecture Series um, event that the College for Creative Studies is doing on um, the, uh, September 23rd featuring Root of Two. And Root of Two has been working with Design Corps to um, develop um, a training program around inclusive design practices um, for Design Corps, our city of design partners, and the college. And um, Cezanne Charles and John Marshall will be talking about that work today. And I think it's really, it's really important in this moment as we think about um, you know, sy systemic um, forms of oppression and uh, marginalization, how we can create new processes, new ways of working that start to break um, those systemic um, um, uh, forces. This next story comes to us from our show on Detroit Public Television called Detroit Performs. Dark Room Detroit is a nonprofit that supports photographers and visual storytelling from all different perspectives. Right now, COVID has made all of their classes virtual, but the creativity isn't stopping. As a nonprofit um, community organization, giving the community access to cameras is really important. So people who are in the neighborhood can stop by and um, check out a, you know, Canon AE-1, which is a great camera to learn on, um, and can come in and check it out for a week. Um, it actually costs nothing. Um, there's no money involved in that. Uh, we loan those cameras out with the hopes that people are 
discovering a new art form or brushing up on an old art form. And they can come in and uh, borrow a camera. We'll show you how to load the film. We regularly hold classes that teach people how to process black and white film. Um, we have the facilities here for people to do that themselves as well as make prints. So, you know, giving access to the community for the, sort of that whole spectrum of, of, of being interested in something all the way to creating a body of work that makes them feel good about that journey is really important to us. We have a really great membership base. Our, our membership base is currently sitting around 100 people. To be able to build a community of photographers um, who are all sort of interested in the same thing and then finding out beyond that how we can all connect uh, is, is really Im important work for us. Even now as, as sort of new as a lot of like digital media is and the way we consume imagery, I think even younger people are starting to feel that that disconnection between their work and how it's being made and how it's being viewed. And there is some more um, importance being put on to being able to physically touch that. And, and, and especially with things like um, a print swap, you know, it's a really great way to interact with your, your community, with your, with your fellow photographers, fellow artists, on this journey of, of making these sort of very defined decisions on wanting to you know, create work in a specific way, how can we facilitate that? And a lot of times it comes down to something as simple as having access to film. We are kind of far removed from the era of film. Um, those things are hard to come by. And, and as we're seeing this resurgence, we're, we're seeing more and more access coming to not just the artists, but the people who support them. So um, I think, yeah, it's, um, it's a great thing happening for younger artists. Um, and the great thing about film photography is the patience that is inherent in the art form, right? So um, having to be limited by how many exposures you have on a roll of film or what, you know, ISO your, your film is and how, you know, it works in certain lighting conditions, all those things help photographers develop a style and develop a, a workflow. And, Film's really great because it has all those things built into it. So um, we've had some gallery walkthroughs of shows that have been up around the city, um, photo walks, um, trying to bring in people to talk to our members about things that are important to them. Sometimes it's about ensuring equipment. Sometimes it's about um, what you know legal ramifications you might have if you're shooting somewhere in public. Uh, we've done really great architectural photo walks things that our members say, these are things that are important to us or that we like, and being able to facilitate that to them in a way that is sort of, you know, um, impactful, but not impossible for us to, to do on a regular basis. Um, so, so as a community organization, we recognize that a, 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 an important part of interacting with our community is interacting with its youth. Um, so being able to offer youth classes and workshops and working with other organizations in our community is really important to us. So um, in the past year, we've partnered with a few organizations, um, Capturing Belief, as well as the Downtown Boxing Gym, and finding organizations that have access to youth that want to learn how to make images is really great. So for us to be able to go in there with you know, five or six cameras and find kids that really want to learn and teach them from the basics all the way to printing work and having an exhibition of that work is really great for building a generation of, a new generation of, you know, Detroit photographers. Musician and founder of the Sphinx organization, Aaron Dworkin, has a new interview series here on Detroit Public Television called Arts Engines. Well, this week, he talked with the founder and artistic director of the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, Terry Lynn Carrington. They talked about the changing roles for women in jazz. What is an institute for jazz and gender justice? Um, it's just a, a way to bring attention to this really, really big problem of uh, gender parity in jazz. Um, and also just in the music industry in general, but my focus is jazz because that's my background and that's 
basically, um, you know, the, where I make my living um, and what I teach. But um, it started off um, with just meeting with some students, some women students that uh, told me some stories that were just kind of shocking because I didn't grow up with the same kind of experience they did. It really opened my eyes to seeing that these issues really needed to be addressed at our institution, but just in the field in general. And just because um, I had a very exceptional career and childhood and was protected and kind of ushered into uh, the jazz world by my father and other greats, um, I, I had a responsibility now to really look at the issue from without of my own perspective and try to you know, bring others along with me and to point out to my colleagues and um, comrades in the jazz world and mentors even um, that something is terribly wrong. There are clearly these issues relating to, to gender and jazz. Um, what are the ways in which you address it? Are there different kind of focus areas or pockets or ways that you tackle it? Well, the first way is just uh, providing a, 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 a safe, nurturing place for um, not just young women, but um, people from the entire gender spectrum uh, to be able to learn the music. That's like the first thing, um, because there, there are transgender students that I didn't know were at Berkeley um, that have found us. Um, and a lot of young women that always feel this barrier, you know, when, even in a classroom or in an ensemble, uh, they, don't, they don't feel as supported and nurtured. So even the young men that are in our program, because it's not just for women, um, but since these young men have gravitated to this program, the young women feel um, supported by them and not uh, judged and, um, and not, you know, like, like, um, like they're be being given opportunity just because they are women. Uh, they feel like, you know, they really have uh, an environment to buckle down and try to learn this music, which is hard enough in itself. Um, and we also have a lot of guest artists to come in and give them, um, you know, lessons and, uh, and you know, lead, lead ensembles, do uh, composition work, private lessons. Um, they come for, you know, a few days at a time. So I think that within a semester, we might have six or seven guest artists, which are great opportunities for the students, you know, to, to learn directly from, you know, these masterful musicians. What would you like to see different in the field, say, 10 years from now, um, that you would have been instrumental in, in helping to bring about? People, it seems to me that people just say that they didn't realize that um, this problem existed, and um, which is, it seems odd, but I can relate to it because I didn't as well for so long, and I'm in it. Um, so I think that just this awareness of, oh, right, there is something wrong. With it. None of the music that we play, none of the composers are women, none of the jazz standards are written by women. Um, most of the band leaders aren't. So you have patrons, uh, presenters, you know, radio uh, journalists, all, all people that are coming now more to a consciousness around, around this issue. And I, I see it changing, so I'm extremely hopeful. Um, but in 10 years' time, it, it would be great to see, uh, you know, more gender equality in, in our field. And not just in the performers, but uh, also, you know, with, with education, with teachers, uh, uh, you know, with journalists, with scholars. Um, so that's kind of, you know, my, my goal in 10 years is to, is to have helped contribute to uh, that kind of equality. So you touched a little on, you know, you've had this extraordinary opportunity and really was able to come into jazz early and, and have had just such an extraordinary um, career. Um, when did you kind of realize this is my thing, right? Was there a moment that that kind of happened for you? No, that, I always felt ownership in the music. And that's the first thing that I try to um, you know, relate to our students um, that this is your music. You know, you have the right to be here. You have the right to play it. And um, I, it was hard for me at first to relate to people that didn't feel that way because I've always felt that. Um, but just to, you know, kind of stand in your own authenticity 
uh, you know, in, inside of the music is not easy for a lot of people. And also, I, I think so many of, uh, so, so much of what we come to expect from a jazz musician um, is steeped in masculinity. So uh, we, we have not fully accepted the feminine aesthetic, you know, in, in the music. So um, I think that everybody has to start to listen differently. Um, and even myself, I've, I've even, I've had to start to listen differently and, and I'll also look at um, my own playing because I've always compared it to every other guy out there. So I had to be just as strong and just as, um, you know, in touch with, you know, my own masculinity to be competitive with them. And so it, now it's like a whole different way of thinking. You know, it's, it's a transformational, really. And finally, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra has done a number of things since the pandemic to continue to connect music lovers with the symphony, from porch performances to virtual concerts to outdoor socially distanced events. It has been a real creative change, an ever evolving way to connect us all through music, the universal language. So the DSO asked music lovers to participate in a virtual collaborative ensemble. Principal cellist Jeremy Crosmer used an arrangement of Gustav Holst's Jupiter from the planets. You'll recognize it. 250 performers submitted videos and the DSO put it together and called it Spirit of Detroit, a Symphony of the People. I would say close your eyes and listen, but then you'd miss the amazing faces of all the performers. I love this. Enjoy it. And I'll see you next time.
You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. And viewers like you.